Okay, welcome back to Talk of the Now podcast, and this is Gene back with you again, and I hope everybody's doing well. Today, we've got a special guest. Um, recently, we had a guest on talking about uh, careers. That was Ashley Freeman. Uh, she's kind of specialized in careers and everything, and today I have another unique guest on. That's a guy that I've been wanting to talk to kind of a, about his passion and what he does, and his name is Matt Drake, and uh, he is in... Well, I guess you might call it, um, I call it organic farming, so to speak, but there's probably more to that. Um, how you doing, Matt? Doing well, Gene. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. So um, what would you say uh, this is as far as your passion goes? What would you call it and kind of what do you, what do, you do with it? Yeah, um, so the a brief synopsis, you could call it, or, organic is accurate. It's certainly organic, um, but more importantly, it's local is kind of what I try to focus on. Um, and then the, I guess the kind of slang term for it is urban farming because uh, oh. it's still in a somewhat city environment, which is the, the key difference between what you would consider a traditional farm, let's say. Right. Or as opposed to a suburban farming, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you know, you got urban, suburban, and, and rural if you want to get technical, I guess. <laughs> well, I guess with suburban, on a more broader level, like you have more room depending on your suburban area to do some farming, I guess, where you can have like, like you're in Atlanta. So it's possible to have an acre of land or a half acre of land, as opposed to someone like living in, you know, New York city where they have to like farm on top of their building, you know? Exactly. And which actually you, you joke about that, but that is a, a fairly popular farming model in some cities mm -hmm. uh is a uh, it's a rooftop mod, uh, rooftop farming that's what they call it um so you kind of work with what you have in these scenarios um you know we're fairly blessed in our area where there there is land not decently priced uh but there is you know decent sized yards and you know some acreage you can grab here and there but exactly like you said you know in a really dense city you know, Atlanta, you know, heart of Atlanta, heart of New York, all those, you know, you might have a five by five yard that you got to start working with. So well, you, you yeah, oh, go ahead. I was to say, you just kind of, you know, start with what you got and kind of grow from there as best you can. Well, I would think that um, in the future, because all the statistics and things like articles I read and things I see on television, they keep pointing to our society or country. I don't know about other countries, but ours tends to becoming way more urban and way less rural than it used to be. So I would think that those factors are very important for somebody that wants to go into this field, you know, at any level, right? Exactly. And, and that ties a, a little bit into my, my backstory, how we got here. But one of the, the overarching themes in terms of whether you, whether you're talking about urban farming or regular farming or whatnot, is that the, the number of people doing it is greatly decreasing it however as we all know the demand for food is greatly increasing so we've got a, a pretty big offset that we're our, our generation is going to have to figure out somehow um but mm -hmm. the yeah the land that that's the number one issue for people wanting to do it is you know where where do you find land and uh on top of that where do you find affordable land is the bigger challenge so right well, I guess, well, you mentioned that, like, just give me a brief, I guess, a synopsis sort of of what your background, you know, how you grew up, and then sort of what led you into um, getting into this, and I guess the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, quick background, I, I grew up in Peachtree Corners, Georgia, um, you know, went to, went to middle school in that area, went to high school there, uh, went to high school at Norcross, and really didn't have uh, a good idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, I assumed I would follow my dad's footsteps for a while. Uh, he was a, a civil engineer. So I figured I would just do some type of engineering. You know, I was decent at math and science and all that. Uh, but getting to my junior, senior year of high school, I, I just really didn't want anything to do with more schooling, honestly. <laughs> just, I just, you know, the thought of it was just soul draining. Uh, so I ended up pursuing the military path. Um, and so end of my junior year, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Um, 
and basically scheduled to ship out a week after graduating high school. Um, uh, and, oh, wow. uh, I'd still, yeah, yeah, it was, it was the, the reactions at the time were less than ideal because this was 2008. So still in the, the heart of the Iraq war. Hmm. And, uh, I had quite a few parents of classmates come up to me and point blank, tell me, Oh, so you, uh, you realize you'll probably die over there. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> they're just thinking, I don't think you're supposed to be telling me that, <laughs> but so, um, but yeah, that, I just, I, I felt that's what the Lord's calling was. So I pursued that, um, ended up getting a, uh, somewhat medical discharge after almost graduating boot camp. It was right at the end, um, ended up getting discharged for a uh, gluten allergy actually. Mm. And, um, long story short, uh, tried to reenlist and that just wasn't, wasn't the Lord's calling. So I, uh. I was working at a movie theater prior to that. So I went back there and I did some more work as a manager, but I really ended up going from there into healthcare. Uh, I went into a uh, EMS and worked as a EMT and then a paramedic for about five, five and a half years and uh, did some time down at Grady. Uh, really enjoyed it, but it, it was, it was definitely challenging, but it, it's not, it's hard to have a family while doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, you know, as we know, Atlanta traffic is, is a beast and doing that every day was, was rough. So I, uh, yeah, again, kind of hit this crossroads of didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, even got into uh, carpentry for a while. I had, you know, I've done maintenance work on and off most of my life. And, um, so one of the overarching themes that you can kind of see is, is working with my hands. That was one I really held on to, uh, being active, working outside was something that really kind of spoke to me. So mm -hmm. honestly, it kind of became, it was an accident that I, I found farming because we were at our townhouse in Duluth at a tiny backyard. I, I could barely squeeze in two four foot beds back there. I mean, just tiny spot. And my wife and I had just talked about, well, it's, you know, try planting some stuff could be fun. Uh, and I tell you the first green bean that actually germinated and started growing was just, I was over the moon. It was the best feeling. Is it the um, Mickey and the beanstalk uh, moment? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, yeah, it was incredible of like, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I prepped the soil, I got the seed in there. I somehow kept it alive and it even grew. And then when it began producing beans, I was like, oh my word, I just, I just grew my own food. And, um, so it, it really, it really spoke to me unlike anything else. And, um, we, we grew a few more things and it, it you know, God was gracious, gracious enough to let all those things grow and I didn't kill them all. So <laughs> it, uh, it really kind of was like, wow, okay, this is fun to do. Is there any way that you can make this a, a job or a career and it was so daunting for a while that I, I really kind of tossed the idea aside um but we finally buckled down at one point at the townhouse like okay if we want to do this what is it going to what is it going to take what what would it look like and we really started to look at like okay we'll need we'll need land uh we'll need um you know set up uh, you know, resources, agri um, irrigation, um, maybe people who can have some land that we can borrow from. And so really started reaching out. Mm -hmm. um, but that was where it started from. It really was just, let's try it. And yeah, this is perfect. <laughs> so it wasn't something that you had a, um, you know, like some kids will grow up wanting to be a hockey player since they were two or, you know, wanting to be a doctor since they were 10, this is sort of something that kind of um, snowballed a little bit over time. And then you had some aha moments where you decided that it was really what you, Hey, this could be my, this could be my calling, if you will. Absolutely. And it's funny. My, my dad actually grew up on a farm. He grew up down in Swainsboro um, and his parents had a, a, a fully functional um, farm at one point growing corn and they had hogs and all that. And, but even when we would go down there to visit as kids, it, it never, 
and it wasn't uh, fully functioning at that point because they were older at the time. But uh, but even knowing that it it had been a farm, it really never struck me as oh, this is something I would love to do, or you know, I could see myself getting involved in this. It was just kind of one of those oh, that's cool, and then you know, move along moments. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's I've, I've I've kind of joked my dad that I I guess it was in the blood the whole time and I just didn't know it, but. <laughs> Well, I guess that in most all of us that are at least you're, if you're if you have roots in the south, you have some roots to farming, I would imagine, or um, absolutely right, <laughs> some kind of way. You know, my grand it goes back into my family some. Um, my grandpa, who you know when I was little was in the suburbs of Atlanta, he used to have an entire bed behind a garage that was where he grew tomatoes. I mean, it was just like yeah. five little rows of beds where he just grew tons of tomatoes and. And whatnot, oh, mostly yeah. tomatoes. <laughs> I love it. Oh, to- oh, tomatoes are a staple. If you grow, you got to do tomatoes. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so do you have? Um, okay, so you've got that kind of all established, and now you're, and now what are you doing with this? Um, I know you have. You, this isn't your full time gig yet, but you're working toward that. So, what are you doing right now with it? Yeah. So we. We have slowly been growing. This is our second official season of growing and selling, I should say. So we we started last year with a small greenhouse that we built on my parents' property uh, up in Pushton. Mm-hmm. And we also had a few beds at the Lilburn Community Garden that we were working in. Uh, but with our recent move, the garden just became too far to maintain on a daily or e- even a couple days a week basis just with the the drive so we've we're so we're focusing solely on the greenhouse this season and e- even that is i mean the the actual square footage is only about 300 square feet uh, so we're talking about four a little bit less than four standard beds um which uh, a, hmm. a standard bed is a uh, it's 30 inches or, or two and a half feet by about 25 feet um so it's it's not even four of those so it, it's a pretty small space but um but like i mentioned earlier like um, the land is the hardest part to get a hold of um just because the the cost in our area is so high For sure so um yeah we're, we're basically working with what we got right now and it we've been able to do quite a decent bit um with that small space uh we have so far grown this season a about a bed and a half worth of lettuce uh including full bed of green beans cucumbers cherry tomatoes heirloom tomatoes um so even though it is a small space we are able to do a good quite a bit with it but we uh we're definitely hitting the the peak of what we can do just because that limitation mm-hmm. So I guess you have enough b- abundance that you're able to sell it. Is that part of the plan or do you like um, allocate some for family and then others to get into the rhythm of making it into a business? Yeah, good question. So it, it's funny, part of my, part of the trade-off with doing it on my parents' property is that I, I allow them to get first cut of stuff. Um, so they, uh, and, and they're, they're very, they're very humble in that regard and that they, they really don't ask for a lot and sometimes they don't want anything for the week. Um, but ju- just as a, a nice payment, that's always been one of my priorities. Um, but after that, most of it is allocated directly for the Lilburn farmer's market where we primarily sell out this season. We, we had attempted to do the, the CSA model last year, um, which is essentially where you invest in a, <clears throat> excuse me, where you invest in a, but you're, it's, it's almost an investment model. So you, you essentially buy into a farm season um, for X amount of dollars. And then every week you get a basket of whatever comes up that week. Um, so it's a, it's an awesome model for folks who like variety, um, who aren't too picky about what they absolutely have to have each week that they just kind of want what what the ground produces each week essentially so we uh, we had attempted to do it. i say attempted because we we had started to do it and then quickly realized that we were not going to pre- be producing enough to fulfill that for multiple people 
as well as selling at a farmer's market. Um, so we ended up having to back off of that. Hence why we're focusing solely on just the farmer's market this season. Um, wow. But, um, and then anything extra that we don't sell, you know, our, our family will eat or we'll give away. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yes, the, the ultimate goal is that, you know, we'll show up to market every week with the truck full and then whatever the extra is, we can, you know, give away as, as, uh, as needed or, or eat ourselves, of course. Is the farmer's market, I know that um, I'm familiar with the one you've had because I've been to it and, and you sell out usually at those, don't you? Pretty easily. I do. I do. Um, especially for the, the, the higher value crops, um, such as lettuce mixes or tomatoes. I, there was a while where I would list the tomatoes online and I would be sold out within 15, 20 minutes. Wow. Uh, because people knew when we would go live on the, on the website. <laughs> so, and again, I mean, we were only producing, you know, four or five pints of cherry tomatoes at a time. Um, and so there wasn't a huge number just because the, the volume we were able to do, but, um, but people, they wanted it and they were, they wanted to get it first. So, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Are there other, uh, in the, at least in the Metro Atlanta area, I'm sure other cities do it. Are there other farmers markets for other little, you know, suburban towns like your Suwannee or Lawrenceville or Alpharetta? Yeah, absolutely. And they've actually become, uh, partly the, this feels uh, twisted to say, but and partly in thanks to COVID, um, because the the demand for wanting to get high quality, fresh local produce went up with that. Especially when folks were able to start going outdoors more, they wanted a good outdoors activity to do, mm-hmm. and the demand for farmers markets skyrocketed in our area. Um, so Lilburn has been a staple one for a while. Uh, Snellville, they have been operating one for a while. Uh, Flowery Branch, they're a newer one that popped up. Um, and then there's another one in, I believe it's, I know there's one in Houston, which is also in the area. Um, and I believe Swanee might as well. Um, but the other ones for mm-hmm. sure have one that goes uh, all summer long. So yeah, the, the so demand you, is certainly. I'm sorry, do you stay with Lilburn because of um, that's just what you know and like, or do you, are you wanting to branch out into other ones and do other ones? Um, I have a, I have a very good rapport with the, the folks that run the market there. Um, so I, I've chosen to go there just because that's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, and at the time it was the closest to where we were living when we were down in Lilburn, but I think as our as we're able to grow our production, we'll probably branch out to other markets, partly because they they operate on different days, which is nice. Um, mm-hmm. So Lilburn is on Friday, Snellville's on Saturday, uh, Flowery Branch, I believe, is even on uh, Wednesday or Thursday. So that helps kind of diversify a bit and branch out to other areas. But for now, Lilburn is our is our mainstay. And I guess, um, well, would, um, you know, when I was little, the closest I can remember to a farmer's market was the, uh, the fruit stand, you know, like when you're going down right. the road, <laughs> um, do those, do people even operate those or do they even get people to like contribute to those type of things anymore? Or is that just like, unless you live in Albany, Georgia or, you know, Sumter, South Carolina or something Exactly. I, I think, so the fruit stand model, kind of like you're talking about, I've really only seen those in, you know, we, we went to the beach a few weeks back and we passed probably a good dozen of those along the route there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it's South Carolina that really, really capitalizes on those. I don't see them that much in Georgia, you know, mm-hmm. every now and then, but, but the, the farmer's market, it, their model is so great because they basically take all of those folks that want to do that and give them one place where they can all set up. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of like that, the car dealership mentality, you know, when you see one, you know, there's like 15 others around there basically is they've taken that same idea of like, if you're attracted to this vendor, let's go ahead and throw these other 20 over here. And then you can also explore them while you're over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, 
but in, in terms of like the individual stands on the, along the roads, we, we really don't see that in our area. Um, I think, I think the farmer's market is the, is the best place. If you're trying to find local stuff like that, you, mm -hmm. you definitely want to go to the farmer's market. Yeah. That leads to a good question. If somebody was looking to get, uh, it just into purchasing that stuff, um, you know, locally, I guess the farmer's market is where to go. I just know of Metro land and the ones you mentioned, like if you're, say you're listening to this podcast and you live in Marietta, I would assume places like Cobb County or Fulton County, or if you live in Greenville, that they have similar, um, I don't know if you ever researched that or not. Not in terms of up that way. Um, mm -hmm. but I know that when you get towards bigger cities, they have bigger farmer's markets. So you have, you know, if you're down inside the perimeter, you've got the DeKalb Farmer's Market, um, which is huge. Uh, they are they are quite a beast. I, I would not advise going early Saturday morning. <laughs> I made that mistake once. <laughs> um, but they they are very cool. Um, but in terms of the, the little ones, at most, I don't, I don't want to say most cities, but I, I know they're becoming more popular. Um, so, a, you know, a, a quick Google search can answer that. But yeah. Yeah, just how much they've grown in our area alone, I would imagine they're growing equally as much in other areas. But um, but yeah, I mean Atlanta, they've got the DeKalb Farmers Market, they've got Freedom Farmers Market, which is another huge one. Um, and that's actually one of the main. Um, I don't know how to. It's one of the main ones that farmers from way outside of Atlanta. That's the one they're willing to drive to. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of folks I'm familiar with that drive one to two and a half hours just to go sell there every Saturday morning because that is the that's oh, the main wow. kind of local produce farmers market I should say but you you don't have um, any interest at all in the future to to sell out of that do you uh it would be far down the road it would be far down the road it's mm -hmm. the the nice thing about that is you you're guaranteed a lot of foot traffic and you know foot traffic typically leads to higher sales mm -hmm. so but again in our area if in my case if i can diversify be, between a couple smaller farmers markets i could probably do equally as well that's what i was thinking um, and uh and you know that saves me an hour and a half trip into atlanta which already sounds better for me so <laughs> <laughs> right oh man Golly, Matt, we're going to have to get, get you on again sometime. And this is going to, going to be an audio only, but maybe we'll have to have your pretty face on with next time to talk more about sure, this sure. stuff. I'm kind of doing a, uh, if you want to come back on. We're Absolutely. Just, we're just going to do an overview this time around and uh, maybe we'll go a little bit more in depth in some things next time. Well, let's, um, let's just uh, talk about a few more things if you got a time. Got time sure, here. sure. What is the... Um, I don't know if you have a dream, but I, you know what, that's always the question you'll hear people ask is what's the dream. Yeah. The, the dream in our case, um, I think is, is twofold in a sense. So to become profitable doing this and, and that sound, that sounds shallow on the surface, but, um, and this is a whole nother conversation, but one of the, one of the big roadblocks for farming or I should say small scale urban farming is doing it well enough that it's profitable that you can keep doing it. And so that you give customers the best price, the best produce, and that you can still put food on your own table, so to speak. So growing ourselves to a point where we can do this full time permanently and profitably is definitely one of the main goals. Um, but the second one I think is to become I haven't quite gotten down how I want to verbalize it, but essentially become a hub of a hub of the community, whether that's through some farming and gardening education or, um, you know, maybe we do fun events and activities. And, but it's, it's something that when you hear the name of that farm, you know exactly what it represents and what they have. And, and there's a couple of ones that I can think of that have that and I've and I've seen how they've modeled and kind of grown around their community and the community wants to be a part of them and that's definitely something that's attractive in terms of I don't want to just sell stuff and make money you know that's that it doesn't you know I, I can make money doing anything but to be able to do this and to be able to 
give something of value back to people in terms of the produce itself, but then also in terms of why we do what you, we do, offer some education, you know, offer some fun activities with it, offer a fun place you can go hang out, maybe see some animals, something like that. Yeah. Um, so our, our goal is certainly not one of these uh, lar- large acre farms, I would say. Um, and that's, and I, I definitely want to talk later about in terms of, you know, when people think of farm, what that actually means, because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's so many definitions, but you know, our, our goal is probably, you know, five, 10 acres is, is the ultimate goal in terms of what we envision ourselves doing. Um, so we are, we are, we have no intention of being a, you know, a 50, 200 acre farm. So, mm-hmm. right. This is not a mass scale thing. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. What um, before I forget to ask you before the end of it, do you um want to give a website for people to um, find your farm on? Yeah, um, so it is, and and I'll be the first to admit, um, I am I am horrible about updating uh, the website and social media in that aspect. Um, just you know, since it's essentially me doing all the farming and stuff, it's also just me doing the the web and the social media. Um, so it may not be the most up to date, but it does have good information on it, I will say. So, um, mm-hmm. but it, so our farm name is um, Georgia Hands Farm. And so if you just go on to www and then do that same one, Georgia Hands Farm, then it will pop right up. Um, and it has links to social media, uh, it has links to, uh, you know, so we're on Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, but then also has, you know, you can send us a message directly. You can ask questions about produce, how we do what we do, all that fun stuff. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, www.georgiahandsfarm.com. So, okay. And, um, uh, as far as, um, you know, getting into it, um, I guess that might be a good thing to explore next time for, cause I'm sure a lot of people have sort of a, um, you know, they may not have a, um, profit type of a model in their head but i think a lot of people Mm -hmm. more and more especially with the organic craze that's been going on for what probably 20 plus years in their mind they're probably thinking you know what if i have an acre of land or what if i have a you know what if i would just want to grow some stuff in my backyard how can i do that i think that would be something good to explore next time as far as somebody that's saying hey i just want to have i just want to provide my own vegetable so i can save on my budget you know absolutely (laughs) I think Absolutely. That, that, you know, for me, that's sort of like as somebody that's not into farming or doesn't think much about, I didn't think much about it until we talked about it, but I think that that's sure. something, you know, if you want to touch on that before we go, that would be something good as far as um, what some people can be thinking about as far as their own, you know, what, what's some things that they need to think about for getting their own fresh produce without having to spend an arm and a leg. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's kind of funny. There's been so many studies and statistics done on, if folks were to grow their own food and, you know, just based on the, the acreage in most States that's available. Um, and uh, you know, when, when I say acreage, you know, I'm thinking of people's front yards and backyards, you no know, grass, you know, and, in the, in the farming community, just unused, untouched grass is an absolute waste of space because, you know, it, it looks nice. A nice mode lawn lawn looks nice, but off there's, offers nothing in terms of you know food or economic value or anything like that um so most folks are like oh i don't have farming land i'm like you you do have farming land if you have a front yard or a backyard you have farming land so the the <laughs> first the first thing to really think about is you know do does my yard anywhere does it get sun you know and, and when when we're, when we're talking sun like you know, not a few hours of afternoon and sun, you know, you're typically thinking, you know, six to eight hours of sun somewhere. So if you have open right. land that gets that amount of sun, you can grow stuff already. Um, and from there, it's just a matter of, you know, clearing out some land, you know, figuring out what you want to grow and, and the figuring out what you want to grow, that can be the challenge because there, there are certain times you can't grow certain crops. You know, if you if you try to plant tomatoes in December, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Yeah. Um. So, but uh, 
but we're we're blessed down in Georgia in that we're in a um, our climate zone. We're at, we're, where we are specifically is what we call the the seven B to eight A climate zone, and basically what that determines is the the range of temperatures that we get every year, and our range is so good for growing that you can grow some crops literally year round, um, all winter long in Georgia, and mm -hmm. they. Winter is, in some states, winter is a dead time that you can't grow anything. Um, but Georgia, you know, our, our winters are not a, as extreme as most other places. So uh, you can grow all year round. You can grow something all year round for sure. So, but yeah, if you've get, if you got some land that gets sun, yeah, you can absolutely grow something. Well, with all things equal is our... Like you say, you're an ignoramus like I am <laughs> when it comes yeah. to growing something. Is it, uh, are tomatoes a good place to start? So tomatoes, yes and no. Tomatoes are a lot of work, but they, if, if they're in your own yard, and, and I say that because our, our tomatoes are not in our own yard. They're, I have to commute to our greenhouse. Um, but if they're in your own yard and you're willing to go out every day for five minutes to take a look at them and deal with them if you need to, then you can absolutely grow tomatoes. Mm. Um, they are time consuming when it comes to pruning, tying them up, all that. Um, but they're, especially cherry tomatoes, cherry tomatoes are fairly easy to grow. Uh, but in terms of the, the easiest ones to grow, honestly, I would probably say either green beans um, or maybe mm. even lettuce. Um, Hmm. Lettuce is a fairly quick growing crop uh, and it doesn't, you don't have to, you know, prune it and tie it up like any of these other, you know, branching vegetables. Green beans are also extremely easy. Uh, if you get what's called the, the bush variety, that you basically throw the seed in the ground and it just kind of sprawls where it grows and starts spitting out beans. And right. again, doesn't really require repruning and tying up. So the, those are the, the easiest, I would say. Um, tomatoes are a, they're a ton of fun to grow. They're a lot of fun to grow and seeing them produce and, you know, get mature. But they, but they do acquire certainly the most work of any vegetable, I would say. Well, you, hear, you heard it here first, folks. The tomatoes are the toughest to grow. <laughs> it requires the most work. Wow. I would not have actually guessed that, just to show my ignorance. Um, well, yeah, Matt, I, it, um, yeah, go ahead. I was just to say real quick, just to give a perspective, I, the, I mean, we, we are going about 25, 30 tomato plants, so we do have a lot. Um, but the other day, I, it took me about, it was about two hours of, of pruning and, and tying up and mm -hmm. trimming branches. Um, and that was about one, one, one week, about maybe two weeks worth of work right there. Wow. So that, um, yeah, it can That's definitely funny. be time consuming. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never realized that my grandpa back there in the yard was doing that much work on those tomatoes. I mean, I just saw, oh, him, yeah. you know, he'd just show up from the patch and have his little basket of tomatoes that he got, you know, and <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> of course he was the kind of guy that would just eat it like it was an apple, you know, just right there. In the oh, yard. absolutely. Oh, was the best. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, I appreciate you coming on and, um, I don't think yeah, that we even you. skimmed the surface. Um, really? So. I, I could go on for hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I'll do is I'll have you on again soonish and, um, sure. what you can do is kind of outline some of the things that we, you may want to talk about and we'll hit, we'll hit on those subjects a little more. Um, and, um, uh, in the meantime, though, everybody can uh, go check out your website again. And that was what again? It is www.georgiahandsfarm.com. All right. Sounds good, everybody. And thanks again for joining us, Matt. And um, we'll see you next time. Sounds good. Thanks again, Gene. All right. Thanks for joining us on Talk of the Now podcast.